and Steve's been harassing me about it. So, so uh, I have a super comfy t-shirt for the first person that can tell me his actual name. Nobody wants a super comfy sleeve. Is it, it's not Steve, it's not Bartholomew, apparently. Oh, all right, well. Awesome. Uh, oh, it's 202. I guess we can go ahead and get started. Uh, so welcome, everybody. Uh, you, we're at Arming Small Security Programs. Awesome. Uh, first off, I stole my company's slideshow template because I'm lazy. Uh, I didn't steal their content, so if I drop a bunch of F-bombs, or there's like some risque pictures, you can sue me, please don't sue my company. Uh, so this is me, Matt Domko. Uh, I'm an instructor for Chiron Technology Services. I teach mostly blue team stuff. That's uh, how I grew up, that's what I did, so uh, kind of would be good to teach stuff you know about, right? Uh, so that's what I do. I'm also a big, big advocate for Cyber Patriot. If you're not aware of Cyber Patriot, please, please, please go home, type it into Google. Uh, it's awesome. I don't know about you, but whenever I was like 10 to 12, the stuff that I did on the internet, if I did it today, I'd be in jail. Um, so it's nice to be able to give those kids uh, a positive outlet for their interest in information security. And so that's what we do with Cyber Patriot. Um, there's teams everywhere. Doesn't cost you anything to be a mentor. You just show up when you can and help, help the kids. Right? There's a lot of teachers that don't necessarily have the background that you do. Uh, and they can manage the kids on a day-to-day -day basis, but it's nice to have you come in and just lend your expertise. Even if you're not an expert, they'll still love the help. Uh, just a couple ways to get a hold of me. I'm on uh, Breaks like Podcast Slack uh, all the time, pretty much. Uh, and then there's my Twitter handle down at the bottom. Uh, so why am I here? I went to Troopers a couple months ago, and they sent this welcome letter out, right? And they were like, we're happy you're here. And the goal of Troopers is to make the world a safer place. And that really resonated with me, so I, I took it, and now it's in all my slides. Uh, because I love it, right? If you know just a little bit more than somebody else about this one facet of security, share it, right? And then I don't have to worry about 100 million people getting WannaCry because you shared that one little piece of information, enable Windows automatic updates. Right? So you shared with somebody, and now the world's a safer place. So please, please do that. Uh, so what I took a look at was detecting malicious network activity. Right? So we can do that with signature-based systems like Snort. Right? Uh, if we try to detect malicious network activity with Snort, uh, this is what the rules look like. And they look like that. And they look like that. They look like that. And they look like that. All in all, just with a default install of Security Onion, uh, you get like 21,000 rules with Snort. Uh, that's a lot, right? We can't fingerprint every single possible attack. We can't. It's impossible. Uh, our signature-based detection methods don't work if we don't have a signature for it, right? So the, the signature for MS2037 that's useless to us, right? Because we don't have it. MS-20 hasn't been publicly released yet. Um, maybe soon. I guess in three years. Uh, so the goal, right, once I thought about that, uh, was to build some baselines, uh, identify malicious network activity, maybe some of that stuff from the, the deep, dark web. Uh, yes, somebody remembers my joke. Uh, and to make it easy for junior analysts to use. So remember I said I was in the Army. So um, if you talk to anybody in the Air Force, those guys in the Army, uh, they're not that smart, right? So uh, that's what all my Air Force friends tell me. Uh, so the goal is to make it easy to use. So I had this idea. And I, was, I had my whiteboard out. And I got up and I started writing stuff down. I was like, step one, build a network baseline. OK, cool. Uh, step two, write a bunch of snort rules. OK, I don't know what I'm going to do after that. Uh, but at the end, right, I want to have to do less work to identify malicious traffic. Uh, so there it is kind of written out to where you can actually read it. I uh, wasn't really sure what technologies I was going to use to do these things, uh, but I thought I was going to go with Snort. And I submitted for a, uh, a training at B-Sides Jackson 
I was like, so I'm going to come up with a nice little training package and teach people how to do this using Snort. Uh, and it got accepted, and I was like, sweet, but now I have to do it. Uh, then I wrote about five, 600 Snort rules and was like, there is no way that I can do what I want to do with Snort. It's way too much work. Uh, there's, there's no way I can do it. Uh, so I thought, well, what else do we do? Uh, how else do we look at malicious activity? So I was thinking, maybe let me take a look at how we've detected malicious binaries. Uh, it, it's still a problem, right? Uh, and then when we first had like the McAfee 1.0, right? What, what were we looking for? How, how did we identify malware? How did you catch back orifice back when you were on AOL? Nobody caught back orifice, right? That didn't happen. But if you did, what were we looking for? It's on the slides. You can holler it out. Three, we were looking for ports, right? We were looking for ego strings. We were looking for some sort of signature. That's all that we were doing. And if you took out port 31337, or if you got rid of that call out that the dude wrote in his malware, well, now that signature isn't going to work anymore. Uh, in today's world, we've got a lot of tools for hopefully just red teamers, but not really, uh, but that people can use to obfuscate their malware. So now I can get a brand new file hash for every single piece of malware that I generate just by using uh, Veil, right? Uh, so what happened after that? McAfee 2.0, maybe three, four, five. Uh, what, what do we do? How do we catch the bad guys? It's on the side. You can say it. Heuristics, right, exactly. So, uh, oh, so a little note about me. Uh, I'm an instructor, so I'm used to interaction. So uh, if I holler out a question, please, please, please feel free to holler back at me. Does that sound like a thing we can do? Yes, awesome, okay, good. Uh, so we did heuristic detection, right? So it's not normal for someone to copy a file to C drive Windows System 32 remotely and then immediately create an at job to execute that file and then that file goes ahead and starts mapping other C drives, right? That's not normal. It's not behavior that typical Windows executables have. Uh, so we go ahead and flag that behavior, right? We'll go ahead and use uh, heuristic detections. Uh, but did that work? Did that stop 100% of the malware? No, definitely not, right? We still have malware. There's still issues. So obviously, heuristic detection isn't going to do everything that we need. Uh, so what did we do after that? Whitelisting, right? Application whitelisting. Uh, I highly recommend, uh, who was it that talked about it? Uh, one of the guys that worked on the Veil project. It was Chris Trunser. Yeah, so Chris Trunser did a talk on uh, now I can, device guard. WMI Device Guard. It's Microsoft's like Windows 10 version of uh, of AppLocker. It's the coolest thing in the world. If you've got 20, 30 minutes, I highly recommend you watch that talk because uh, it's awesome, right? You use these cool tools, and now your network's safer. So, uh, application whitelisting. Uh, what's it do for us? Well, it lets us say, I only want code signed by Microsoft to run. I only want these 50 uh, executables with these hashes to run. I can even say, all right, the C drive admin tools folder, anything in there can run. It's a terrible idea, but it's better than just not having any sort of application whitelisting whatsoever. Uh, but we can say, you're only allowed to run whitelisted tools. Or we can say, uh, you're not allowed to run uh, WCE. You're not allowed to run mimicats.exe, right? We can go and blacklist things as well. Uh, the other option that we have is, uh, is logging. So maybe I don't want to block everything, but I want to log it. I definitely want to know that this new executable was, was uh, ran in my environment. And so I was like, hmm, what's like a really easy way for me to implement uh, AppLocker? And this was what I came up with. I was like, wow, this is actually going to be really easy. Start with an empty whitelist. Create a policy that says you can run anything in the whitelist and log anything else. But I have nothing in my whitelist. So what do I have now? I have a list of every single executable that's being ran on my network. Wow, that's awesome, right? Like, I don't know about you, but if somebody came to me 10 years ago and said, I want to know every single binary that's being executed on your, in your enterprise, I would have been like, uh, no. Like, I wouldn't have been able to do it. But with things like AppLocker and DeviceGuard, I can do that just by turning on logging. So we take that list, we pare it down, uh, maybe I'll go ahead and take some default ones that are out there, right? Like go ahead and allow everything from Microsoft just so I don't spend 
uh, a super long time going through this list. But once I have it built, I can go through, parse through it. Now I have all my business required software. Okay, cool. Let me go ahead and update the policy. Now you're only allowed to execute stuff on the whitelist and nothing else is allowed to execute. Well, how hard is it to implant a system if your implant won't execute? Pretty difficult, right? Like if I can't upload a backdoor, I can't, I'm done, pretty much. Maybe I get it on the system, but I can't go anywhere, can't do anything with it. Uh, so I really, really like application whitelisting uh, and the new device guard. So let's take that same thought process and apply it to network activity. Uh, I'll go ahead and start with an empty whitelist, create a policy to log all the traffic, go through it, and say, okay, this is all on my whitelist, and then log everything else. As time goes on, you'll get some alerts, take a look at those alerts. Did I expect this? Yeah, yeah, I, some, it's a new service, we need it, so let me go and add it to the whitelist. Uh, after a couple weeks, a couple months, you stop getting new alerts. Well, what can you do with that? Well, now I can create firewall rules that say this is what's allowed, block everything else. And I can go to my, uh, my CTO, CTO? Sure, why not? I, CIO. I can go to him and be like, hey, I want to lock down everything that's not this. And he's going to ask me, he's going to say, well, can you guarantee that services aren't going to be interrupted because of these new firewall rules? Has anybody tried to get like new firewall rules put in? Like at your work? It's not fun, right? Because they, they want to guarantee 100% that you're not going to cost the business money. Well, if you start off with your logs and you build that whitelist, now you have 100% guarantee, right? Ish. Somebody's still going to blame you if it goes down, that's for sure. But 99%, uh, you, you at least feel like you're less likely to get fired for doing it. How about that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> And it's your fault because of the firewall rules that the backup didn't work. Uh, so it's a pretty easy thing to say. This is what I want to do. Uh, but how do I do it? How do I get data for my whitelist? Uh, so bro, that's how I'm going to get data for my whitelist. Uh, how do I create a policy to log traffic? So bro scripting gives us that ability. Uh, show of hands, has anybody worked with bro scripting before? A couple few? OK, cool. We're going to go over some basics in a little bit, and it'll Hopefully you'll kind of, it won't feel like magic anymore. Uh, and then reviewing new logs. So basically to review the new logs once I have the logging policy in place, uh, whatever SIM I'm using, right? If I'm cheap and poor, a small security program, maybe I'll use Elsa, maybe I'll use Elasticsearch. Um, if I've got more money, maybe I'll use some cool new tools that I don't even know about because I've never had a big budget. Um, but you've got lots and lots of options. Uh, so if you haven't, if you don't know about Bro or if you haven't heard about it before except in passing, uh, disclaimer here is my name is not Seth Hall, right? It's Matt Domko. I'm, I know what I like about it and I know what I use it for. Uh, if I tell you a lie, I'm sorry. You can beat me up later. Uh, so in 30 seconds, it's way more than an IDS suite, right? What I love about it is I get these logs and I can perform actions based on these logs uh, at multiple layers, right? Or based on how uh, packets relate to each other. Whereas with Snort, yeah, I can do triggers, right, and things like that, but there's not a whole lot that I can do with my Snort rules. With Bro, I can see everything from uh, layers two through seven, and then I can pick out what I want to keep and do a whole bunch of cool stuff. Uh, the really nice thing about Bro logs is they're small. So if I have a one gig link, and my link is completely saturated, in an hour, I've got 36, I got three and a half, almost four terabytes of PCAP. I can't keep PCAP that long, right? With uh, NetFlow, my logs are a lot smaller, right? 64 bytes per message, I think, for each flow. Uh, with NetFlow, I, I can keep my logs a lot longer, but there's not a lot of data in them, right? With a NetFlow uh, record, all I really get is source and destination and points. That's it. So that doesn't really help me any if I'm trying to do a bunch of analysis. So with bro, I can pull out all of the ASCII text, any string in a packet, I can pull that out and go ahead and log it and use it later if I want to. It's great, uh, I love it. It's open source and it's built into Security Onion. So you don't even have to know a lot about compiling from source and doing all kinds of crazy stuff with Nix. You can just install Security Onion, now you have bro. Uh, as far as the bro log formatting, <clears throat> 
as we work with it, it's kind of a good idea to understand what they call their different fields. So I give you a cheat sheet uh, that you can reference uh, later. But basically, IP source is the originating host. Uh, source port is the originating port. Destination, response host, response port. Uh, the logs, they're really, really easy to parse if you're a computer. Uh, they're great, I love them, uh, but if you're a human, you're definitely going to want to use some sort of uh, GUI tool to kind of parse through and do queries, that kind of thing. Uh, I, I love Elsa, but I'm, I've heard really cool things about Elastic Stack, so we'll see uh, if I decide to switch, but probably, right, especially since it looks like they're going to switch to Elastic Stack for Security Onion. Uh, as far as the logs go, right, so Broby, the tool that I'm talking about, we'll get to the demo in a minute, but uh, it right now the config is set up for Security Onion. But you do have to know where your logs are, so if you do a custom install of Bro, you'll just need to update these directories. Uh, the three logs that, uh, so two logs that we're definitely going to use and one that I like to look at every once in a while. Uh, so the notice log, that's where uh, my script actually writes its its alerts to is to the notice log. So if you want to see everything that's outside the baseline, go ahead and go there and check. Uh, the con log, so that's just a list of connections that Bro saw, right? Very very simple uh, to take a look at and play with. And then the weird log. So I love the weird log uh, because it basically takes anything that that's either non-standard or Bro can't parse very well, right? Something that might have been obfuscated, and it shows up there. Uh, so whenever I first started trying to do collection uh, with VMware or ESXi, right, they have the option for ER span, right, you can actually go onto a distributed virtual switch and create a uh, GRE tunnel to an endpoint and actually send everything that you would have on a regular span port, so a copy of all the traffic, to any IP endpoint. So I don't have to be on the same switch, I don't have to be uh, in the same uh, on the same VLAN, I don't have to worry about that. I just give it an IP address and it'll get shipped out. Uh, up until a couple months ago, uh, Bro didn't support ER span. It supported GRE tunnels, but not ER span. And so all your stuff would end up in the weird log. Uh, but now it supports it, so you should never see ER span uh, in a Bro log again as, as weird, which is awesome. If you don't know about ER span, I highly recommend you take a look at that too. Uh, all of our scripts that Bro loads, uh, Opt bro share bro policy, that's where it's at uh, on Security Onion. You'll have to find that policy file if you do a custom install. But that's where we list, if you run a new script for bro and you want to try it out, that's where you put it in to get bro to go ahead and load it at startup. Um, oh, I had those backwards. So bro policy is the directory that has all the scripts and then local.bro has the file. I thought that sounded weird when I started talking about it. So I'm at Security Onion Con in 2015. If you haven't been to Security Onion Con, totally love it. You should go. It's in Augusta. I'm sorry, but uh, it's a really good con. Uh, and I'm watching Seth Hall talk about Bro, and he stands up on stage, and I'm really excited because I want to learn about some Bro scripting. It just sounds cool. And what Seth says is the best way to learn to write Bro scripts is to write Bro scripts. I'm like, well, but I don't know how to write Bro scripts, so can you teach me? I thought he was going to stop, and I was super PO'd. Because like we were running short on time, and I was like, but I wanted to learn about how to do that. That's what it said you were going to talk about. And so he went on and talked about it, and we actually picked up some things. But at first, I was freaking out. Still, like if you look at that, it doesn't really make sense. But if you get just a basic primer, right, you go through and do some of the challenges that they have on the Bro website, okay, now you've been trained. And then you practice that on and on, and you start trying to solve problems that you have uh, in your own environment, you're going to get way better at writing bro scripts. It's the same thing for any scripting language, right? If you want to be really good at Python, you got to write a bunch of Python. You'll be really good at C, you got to write a bunch of C. Uh, so it makes sense, and I like it. Uh, so in the interest of learning, uh, and not just taking some file that somebody gave you and installing it on your enterprise network, uh, I figured we'd work through uh, a basic bro script. So I've got simple.bro here, and we'll just go ahead and work through it. So I'm creating a variable called my ports. Uh, if this were Python, it's, it's a list, right? And it's a list of ports. So if you look inside the curly braces, I have TCP, TCP port 21, TCP 22, and then zero, right? It's kind of weird, but Bro looks at ICMP as using port zero, right? Because we're not actually using TCP or IP for the ICMP protocol. So we just put a zero in there. Uh, so that's what I'm doing there is creating a list. 
go down to the next line, I'm saying event bro init. So these events, uh, they can call other events or they can be based on a new packet coming in. Uh, bro init is when bro loads up. When bro loads up, I want it to do what? Uh, I want it to go ahead and print a couple things. So I just wanted to note that you can do format string operations. Uh, with the pipes, we're actually enumerating the number of items in my list, right? And we're just printing it to the screen. Okay, cool. Uh, the next event that we're taking a look at is event new connection. So every time a new connection is detected, do the thing in the curly braces. Well, what do I want it to do? So I want to check the destination port and see if it's in the list. Wait. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to take the destination port, check and see if it's in my list. And if it is, do the thing in the curly braces again. Right? So very, very similar to some other languages if, uh, if you do that kind of thing. And again, uh, we can do format strings, so percent %s actually print this out as a string. So that was just a basic, let's take a look at what bro scripts look like. Uh, baseline report.bro is what I'm using uh, to actually do all the, the logging and, uh, and that kind of thing. Uh, so the way that that works is pretty simple. Uh, I've got a file, baseline.data. It loads a list of source destinations into memory and then checks every single incoming connection. Is this connection going to a host that I care about? If it is, are they allowed to talk on that port? If it is, is the source actually allowed to talk to that port? So it's really nice. I can, I can be as fine-grained as I want to. Uh, and if not, then go ahead and give me an alert. Uh, as far as installing it, it's got its own uh, GitHub repo. If you just want that one little script and you want to do everything manually, you can. Uh, the problem with that is with just the alerts, that means to build the baseline, I would have to take Great, I don't have a log. But I would have to take that log and manually go through and create this super huge long file that says, okay, my domain controller has 37 ports open and uh, this is who's allowed to talk to those ports. I would have to build a file like this manually uh, with just that baseline report .bro script. Does anybody know how many open ports their domain controller has open right now? And it's a lot, right? You got file sharing, you got all kinds of crazy stuff going on there. Uh, so no, I'm not gonna do that. Uh, what I'm gonna do is use a tool that'll go ahead and parse my notice log for alerts and then prompt me. Hey, we saw this port, this service being hosted. Do, do, you, want to, do you want people to connect to that? And then just yes, no, yes, no. Uh, that was the goal with Bropy and we got there. So before we do the demo, just a little bit of a idea of what's going on with the demo network. Uh, so I've got the big bad internet. Uh, I've got two uh, subnets. I've got all my clients on the dot .11 and my server farm. And then I've got my, my sensor plugged in uh, in between the router and the server farm. Let's actually do this. So uh, pretty simple. Get clone the repo. Uh, the only thing that you won't have are these two PCAPs because they're huge, um, but they're just PCAPs that I wrote, so it's not, yeah. Anyway, uh, so the first thing that we'll do once we get Bropy is go ahead and vi, well, in the Etsy directory, uh, I've got the baseline.data file that's blank right now because we're going to fill it up. Uh, baseline report.bro, so that's the bro script that does everything, and then bropy.config. So we're going to need to pop into bropy.config and update a couple of things, right? So if you're set up with Security Onion, you're good. You can just run everything from defaults. Uh, but if you're not, you're gonna need to go in here and configure things like where your logs are stored, where the bro binaries are, um, that kind of thing. My net actually isn't being used right now. Uh, that's for some future updates that I'm working on. But uh, you can go ahead and update that if you want to. <coughs> So 
So I've updated Broby, the Broby config. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and sudo Broby. Oh, that's why. How about I do a tab? There we go. Uh, so, bang. So you launch Bropy, and uh, menu-driven make life easy, right? That's the goal. Uh, so the first thing that I'm going to do is option three, to install it. And it asks you, what subnet do you want to protect? So I don't want to check every single incoming, outgoing connection. I just want to watch ones that are going to my critical infrastructure, right? My clients are going to get owned. It's going to happen. I'm not going to focus on them near as hard, near as, hard as I'm going to focus on uh, that server that makes my company billions of dollars a year, right? So I can type that in. I'm going to type that in here. Uh, you can give it uh, a class. You can give it whatever subnet mask you want. If you just want to focus on one host, give it a 32, right? So 156.22.10.0/24. So I give it a subnet. It's going to go ahead and modify uh, baseline report, install it for us. Uh, it says, hey, you already have baseline data. Do you want to overwrite? That's just because I already installed it once. I'm going to go ahead and overwrite it. Uh, the script already exists. Do you want to overwrite it? And then it's going to ask you, do you want to restart, bro? So funny thing about this, I've got a buddy who's got like 500 bro nodes across his uh, network. And I was like, hey, can you test this for me? He's like, yeah, you know, I got time. No big deal. And he, he runs it. And this was before I put the do you want to restart. So literally all of his nodes restarted. Uh, it was, yeah, I felt kind of bad for him, but uh, whatever, it's his fault. He shouldn't be running untested code on enterprise systems. Yeah, exactly. So I'm going to go ahead and restart Bro and install complete. Cool. So what I can do now is just sit and wait, let traffic be collected, right? Uh, as right now my baseline doesn't have anything in it, so I'm going to get alerts for every single new service and new... Um, source port or source host that I see. Uh, so I've got a PCAP. While that replays, let me go ahead and run Broby again. So now that I've got traffic, now that I have those alerts, they look like this. So if I take a look at this log, I see traffic baseline exception. This is a new destination IP, destination port. So this is a new service we haven't seen before. Uh, and then it gives me all the information about it. So that's what my logs look like. But I don't want to parse through that. That's too much work. So what I'm going to do is go into Bropy. And uh, the first thing that I can do if I want is I can go ahead and do option one, step through my logs. So it's going to go through, parse every single uh, notice log that you have on your system, and pull them in. So that's a lot, right? If if you haven't done this before. You can actually go in to um, baseline.data and give it a custom date and say, hey, the last time that I want you to look back to is uh, April 10th or whatever day you want to go back to. So you can figure that and then you can change it. Uh, in the future, once I get some super cool uh, open source supporters that are going to help me with this, right? I said on Twitter I was going to beg. Please if you help me out if you know how. Uh, but in the future, you'll be able to configure that at runtime and say only go back a week. Uh, but we're not there yet. Uh, so it's just going to prompt me, do I want to allow this? I can say yes. I can say no. What I would love to see is the ability to do comments. Yes, this is MySQL server. Uh, once again, not there yet. Would love the help. Uh, and once we're done, it'll go ahead and update the baseline report and then restart Bro for us. So that's one option. Uh, I was at our local meetup and somebody was like, hey, Matt, you know what would be really cool? is if instead of it giving me one huge baseline, is if you could create separate files so that I can take this one list for the SQL server and give it to the SQL admin. Well, he gets paid for the care and feeding of that SQL server, right? So why is it my job to verify that his uh, ports are correct? How about I hand it to him, let him do a verification? And if he sees anything that's weird, he needs to look into it or let me know about it. And if he doesn't, well, he just said everything's good. So now I have a list that somebody else verified, and I don't have to do all the work. I love sharing work with regular admins. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and go to advanced options, too. Uh, what I can do here, right, uh, number two, create a rule doc per host for analysis. So I'm going to do that. Again, it's going to parse through all my notice logs. And now, in the output directory, 
I've got a Brophy rule file for every single host that was in the logs. Oh. Oh, there's my problem. So that's for that host, 10.246.50.2, it saw SSH and ICMP. That was it. Some of these will be way bigger. What's up? So back there we have the multiple shows. Mm -hmm. uh, is that how you would remove them that's on the bottom back? Um, yeah. So if you need to go through uh, and delete it. So those files are actually located at uh, the actual baseline itself. Well, give me a second and I'll show you. No, you're fine. So, uh, but now I have a list of rules and I can hand those out, bring them back in, and actually put them all together. But that's just a list. These aren't actually being checked. These are just so you can hand them out. So let me go ahead and run Bropy again. And in my advanced options, uh, I have this auto baseline thing. So that's there so that if it's just me, I can go through and manually and not have to switch files 500 times. And so if I do an auto baseline, it's going to go through, parse all the logs, and create the rules. Uh, it says, hey, do you want to restart now? Yes, I want to restart now. So I just created this baseline without looking at all, right? That's bad. So what I'm going to have to do is go ahead and go to that, uh, that scripts directory and open up baseline.data. Uh, so it'll be sudo vi etsy nsm. Sudo locate. No, I don't need to do that. Cat Etsy. Where are my configs? Opt Pro Share. There it is. So sudo vi opt pro share pro policy misc baseline dot data. So now I can go in here. Well, earlier when you asked uh, if I made a mistake and accidentally hit yes when I should have hit no, now I can actually go into this file and make the changes. So let's say that I don't want, I don't expect anyone to ping my domain controller. Escape dd, escape colon x. Done. Uh, once I've done that, I just need to restart bro, and uh, it'll the new rules will take effect. So. Um, the last thing. I'm not in there anymore. Uh, and then the last thing uh, that we're working on, right, it would be great if as a, um, as a consultant, if you could just show up, nobody's running the baseline report script right now, right? I think like maybe 30 people have checked out my GitHub repo, so uh, nobody knows about it. So wouldn't it be great if you could take either NetFlow records or con logs that already exist? and just create rules based on that. I think that would be pretty cool. Uh, one of the guys recommended it. So that's what we're doing now uh, with the option number three in the advanced menu is go ahead and create uh, potential rules using all the con logs. So rather than requiring that baseline report script to exist, I can just process all the con logs and go through those. Uh, it asked me for a file name. Uh, good demo. It's gonna process it. Uh, it asks me if I want to restart bro. That's just because I'm not a good programmer and I haven't taken that function out. Uh, so I'm going to do no. Because all we did was create the list and saved it to the local directory. So I don't need to restart bro because I didn't change any rules. Uh, so now I should have a good.demo file. And there it is. So these are all the rules that I should look at implementing based on uh, my con logs. So the, yeah, let me get out of this and go back to my slides. Uh, so as far as getting uh, Bropy up and running on Security Onion, this is it, pretty simple to do. Uh, yeah, uh, so use cases, right? The big thing that I love about this, I wrote it for me and I was just sharing it with the community, right? So. Uh, the things that I love about it. Now I have a list of every single port protocol uh, and host that's connecting to my critical assets. I love that, right? That's the main reason why I wrote it. Uh, the other thing that I have is alerts now, right? I can get alerts based on anomalous traffic. I don't have to pay 
uh, $6 million for a next generation intrusion detection system. No, those are dumb. Uh, I can do it with a free tool, right? So why don't I do that? Uh, and then now that I have this baseline data, now that I can safely say these are the only ports and protocols that I use, I can have firewall rules. And guess what? If I don't need port 445 open to the internet, I can block it, right? And I can prove that I don't need it because I don't have any new alerts, right? Yay! I don't know. Uh, that's it. Any questions? So I forgot to mention this, but I have bribes. So I have coffee mug and heavy duty notebook, Punisher skull on them, and stickers and t shirts. Does anybody have questions now? <laughs> Yeah, so the question was, have I considered switching it to a GUI for uh, newer people? Uh, I love it, right? I, somebody was like, hey, you can use Decanter to, uh, to go ahead and, I guess that's a Python module that does GUIs. Um, yeah, so I, I love that idea, right? Because apparently it takes you about a year before you get comfortable enough to open something and buy, I guess, apparently, that's what I'm told. Um, so, but yes, I would love to do that. And so, I said it, I'm going to beg. If you know Python and you're pretty good at it, please, please help me. We can do cool stuff like that, right? Make it easy for new people to just use a tool, right? We still have to check their work because they're new anyway, but at least they can do something productive, right? And you don't have to be the go to person all the time. So. Right. That, yeah. So uh, I, I haven't looked into that at all. Like maybe if it's common and it's happening every week on Monday, like that kind of thing. Uh, right. Right. At the point where you have a few thousand emails in a day, that might be abnormal. At the point where you have 12,000 emails in a day, that's obviously abnormal. Yeah. Okay. So, so basically saying this is normal between X and Y based on the data you've gathered to do the same thing. This number of connections to this port is normal and notify me if it drops low Right. Because something may be wrong. Your system died or right. was hacked or were infected or something like that. So, with Xville. Xville, whatever. yeah. So, uh, I love it, right? The question of uh, can we use thresholding, basically, basically right? Yeah. Uh, based on either the alerts or the occurrences. Uh, based the right, based on what I have now. I have all these logs, so that's great. Um, so, Bro scripting supports that. Right, uh, the the demo that I actually watched Seth do was a slow Loris attack, and he was using uh, connection tracking, right? And he was thresholding that kind of thing. It was really cool. It supports it. I need help, so that would be awesome. I'm gonna write it down, and maybe I can figure out how to do it. But yeah, yeah, I would love it. Yeah, I love it. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, create an issue. So, uh, any other questions? I got, I got like a bunch of T-shirts and a bunch of books. Nobody else wants to ask questions. Say what? Can I have a notebook? Yes, you can have a notebook. <laughs> Done. Uh, so the link, uh, GitHub.com. You can just search me, hashtag cyber. Uh, but I have like three projects that I actually have data in. Everything else is garbage. Um, so there's that. Also, I've got a bunch of cards that I'll set out that have the actual link uh, to the repo on it. So in the back. Uh, yeah, so I, I'm a cheater. 
I applied to like seven cons all at once, expecting to get accepted once, uh, and I got accepted to them all. So I've got the same slides for all of them. So if you Google uh, Matt Domko, Bropy, even if you don't find the ones from here, it'll be the same. Uh, I think there's a copy of them in the GitLab uh, or in the GitHub repo too. No? Okay. Well, thank you guys so much for coming out. Uh, it, it really means a lot to me. I appreciate it. Dave who? You have no idea.